Good evening. I'm Connecticut Realtors President Michael Barbaro, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's debate. I'd like to start out by introducing our panelists. First on the left, the CTR TV's own Christy Olds. Next to her is WTNH Chief Capital Correspondent Mark Davis. And to his left, the Connecticut Mayor's Keith Faniff. Our, our candidates for this evening, center left, Danbury Mayor Mark Boughton. Mark is in his ninth consecutive term as mayor of the city of Danbury. Mayor Boughton, welcome. <laughs> to his right is the former first selectman of the town of Trumbull, having served four terms. He's also an attorney with the law firm of Cohen and Wolf. Mr. Hurst. <laughs> To my immediate left is tech entrepreneur, Mr. Obsidnik. He is also a U.S. Naval Academy graduate, and he served on a U.S. Navy nuclear submarine. He resides with his wife and two daughters in Fairfield County, Mr. Steve Obsidnik. And on my far left is a self-made businessman from uh, Fairfield County, where he started his own multi-billion dollar corporation, Canadis Capital. He resides there with his wife and five children, Mr. David Stemmerman. Welcome. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm briefly going to go over the rules one more time. The candidates will be asked a series of randomized questions uh, by our panelists, and they will be in the order of the ballot access. So we will start with Mayor Boughton as the endorsed candidate. Um, two, additional, two additional candidates will have an opportunity, one minute apiece, to either answer that question as well or a rebuttal to whoever answers the question um, originally. All four candidates will have an opportunity, they'll have two one-minute opportunities to challenge any candidate who says something or makes, a, makes an answer to a question that they disagree with. If a candidate is explicitly named and disparaged, he will receive a 30-second opportunity to rebut the previous comments. That will be at my discretion, whether I believe that the rebuttal is warranted. So let's get started with our debate. Our first question is going to come from our own Christy Olds, and she will ask it of Mayor Boughton. Mayor Boughton, Connecticut Realtors, the Association of Realtors, recently conducted a poll. In that poll, 70% of respondents said they had a friend move out of Connecticut within the past three years. What is your proposal to reverse this trend of outward migration? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Thank you, Connecticut Realtors, and of course, News Channel 8 for all of your hard work in putting this program together. What you're referring to really is what we all call the death spiral. Roughly 60 people move out of the state every day, and they move out of the state to other parts because, frankly, Connecticut is too expensive and costs too much to live in. So what we can't do is add to that expense by doing things like expanding the conveyance fee, are doing things like adding a tax on the buyer side of a real estate transaction, or adding any kind of new fees or taxes or whatever onto the heavy burden that these people are already balancing. Connecticut has lost its ability to be competitive across the United States of America. And in all this mess, I really see opportunity. This is our time. This is our moment where everybody's in agreement that we have to do things differently. So we propose things like phasing out the state income tax over the 10 years, and I bet you if we do that, people will stay in Connecticut. We propose things like eliminating the state tax and getting rid of the business entity tax and getting rid of the gift tax, and I bet you people will stay in the state and be able to live here with their grandchildren. Think about the reasons why you came here, or your family came here, or your grandparents came here. This is not the state that I remember, but I guarantee you one thing. Under a Biden administration, this will be the state that you'll never forget. Thank you, Mayor Bowden. Mr. Herbst. My plan to deal with this migration out of our state is to focus on the 800-pound gorilla in the room. People are leaving Connecticut because of the fiscal volatility that is presented in our budget every year. Over the course of more than the last decade, this state has been in sustained, protracted, and structural budget deficit. We're losing 55 to 60 people every single day. So under my plan, in the first 45 days of my administration, 
we're going to get to work right away in coming up with a budget repair bill that finally deals with the $71 billion of unfunded pension and retiree health care liabilities in our state. It is crippling our budget. It is forcing us to cut uh, municipal aid and programs that directly impact people. And when we cut funding for education, property taxes continue to go up. And that's causing the outward migration. We have to eliminate the estate tax. We have to eliminate the Social Security tax for seniors. We have to make this state affordable for people to stay here, and we have to make it affordable to attract people to come here. So under my plan, eliminate the estate tax, the Social Security tax, cut the corporate rates to show businesses we're serious about their investment, but more importantly, deal with the unfunded liabilities and get our budget in balance. Thank you, Mr. Herbst. Uh, Mr. Herbst, one minute. So to turn the moving vans around, your governor has to do two things, walk and chew gum at the same time. The walking is addressing the fiscal mess of Connecticut, which we all know drives people out of this state. And that's the fiscal stability we have to restore to our state. But the chewing gum is how do we inspire people to build a jobs engine here again? Both of those principles come together in my plan, which I believe is the boldest, most comprehensive plan that anyone has put forward, a five-step plan to create 300,000 jobs in Connecticut over the next eight years. We have still not recovered the 30,000 jobs that were lost since before the recession. And since I graduated from college, this state has created 5,600 total net jobs. That is unacceptable, and that has kept us in this downward spiral. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stemmerman would like to use this challenge. I'd like to use this opportunity to answer the question. Absolutely. Uh, can I get one minute on the clock by the timers? So as I've been going all around the state and talking with people like you, uh, Mike, uh, lots of people are leaving, not many people are moving in. We spoke to a woman in Avon at the beginning of the conversation that we're having with people all over, and she has four children here. They're all doctors. They all live in Phoenix. We talked to a gentleman in Mystic who said, I've been here for 40 years. I'm being driven out of my home. My taxes are going up. Cost of living's going up, and my income is fixed. The way that I look at this is the way that I looked at things with my own business. Every day, either we're losing money or making money. If we're losing money, we can't do that. If we're making money, we need to do more of what's working. I look at this as what are the key competitive advantages of our state that attracted people and businesses here for decades? We were a booming state for decades and decades. We have on our website a plan that was recognized by the Hartford Current as the only candidate with details and specifics, davidstowerman.com, of how to make our state low tax and more affordable, how to take advantage of our great location, we're gonna talk about that tonight, and how to make our workforce time is education up, the best in the country. Thank you. Our second question will be asked by Keith Faniff, and it'll be for Mr. Herbst. Mr. Herbst, you mentioned your first budget. I'd like to lay out a problem for you with that budget. Nonpartisan analysts say the first biennial budget you face will have a built-in hole of about $2.3 billion. Another way to say that is a gap of about 12%. And another way to say that is that's three times the best tax revenue growth we ever got in the robust years of the 2000s, meaning you won't be able to grow your way out of it. Compounding the problem, you will not have the power to impose layoffs for the first two years you're in office. How would you balance <clears throat> that budget? Well, this kind of goes to the first question. We're not going to be able to eliminate any taxes in the state of Connecticut until we get honest with the people of the state about the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And Keith, you've covered this a lot, so you know really in the budget where those fixed costs are. They're salary, benefits, retiree health care liabilities. You know, the $2.5 billion you mentioned, I think it's significant to point out, $71 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health care liabilities. Unfunded liability is code language for future tax increases. So if we don't deal with this problem, we're going to continue to cut funding for schools, continue to propose deferring a third of pension costs for teachers to local towns and cities, which will rise property taxes. So in my first budget, it will not only be a budget that is balanced, before that even happens, we have got to put before the legislature structural reforms to how we fund our pensions. The state needs to get out of the retiree health care business. We need to recognize that we need collective bargaining reform in this state because there are certain things that I don't believe management should have to negotiate over. We have to do what other states have done in this regard, or we're going to continue having a conversation like we're having tonight. What has happened over the last 10 years is that revenues continue to go down because people are fleeing the state. 
and the unfunded liabilities to continue to consume more and more of the state budget, which is causing the new economic reality that I referenced. So we have got to pursue and implement and pass pension and benefit reform first 45 days of a new administration. Time is up. Thank you, Mr. Herbst. Mr. Obsidnik, one minute. I'd approach it the same way I did in the military or as a CEO of uh, businesses, high-tech businesses. First of all, it's about forming a team, a team to surround you to help addressing these problems because it is a complex problem. Second element of the team is the legislature, partnering with the legislature to plan a bold vision of where I want to drive us to, 300,000 jobs over the next eight years. And that starts then with discipline to address this $2.3 billion gap that we're looking at. And there are specifics in there that you can get into to address it. You know, number one is in the first 90 days setting, you know, a financial state of emergency to bring in the stakeholders, be it the state employee uh, workers, teachers unions, businesses, taxpayers, to form a, a group to address these issues. And it does address, you know, going after the unfunded liabilities. It goes, we have to address the 20% of our government, which is larger per capita than Massachusetts. So we need to address those structural things along the way, or else we will not get out of this hole. Thank you, Mr. Obstinick. Mr. Stemmerman, you have a minute, sir. Keith, we sat down together to talk about my plan, the first one that I released about how to deal with our over $100, $100 billion of fun, unfunded liabilities and debt. And Tim, we, we can't reform this. We need to restructure it. We've talked about this, and you, you wrote about it in a way that no candidate for governor has ever spoken about this in this state or in any state. The plan that we put up is also about growth. And in order for us to grow, we don't only have a $2.3 billion deficit, we need to cut taxes. We put out a plan that reduces the personal income tax for brackets from seven to three. First $10,000, nothing. Our middle income brackets of four and four and a half, five and five and a half percent to four, and our top bracket of five. So we need to make cuts that we talk about economize, prioritize, and privatize. We give you the details, we give you the numbers, so they're not empty promises, they're things that we're going to be able to deliver. My name was mentioned. And I was going to get into so uh, we have a question, we have a, a, a challenge. Um, I'll wait, I'll wait. Uh, Mark, I'm going to let you use your challenge. We'll give you one minute. Great, thank you very much. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about pensions already because this really is a huge issue within the state of Connecticut. And candidates out there are talking about pension reform. We need pension reform. Let me be very straight with you. We need to eliminate the current pension system as it exists. When we have almost 1,500 people out there that receive pensions of over $100,000 and one pensioner that has a pension of over $300,000, something is grossly wrong with the system. It is unsustainable. It's unsustainable in the, in the future. And it's unfair to tell people that are hired today that they're going to have the same benefit that everybody else has. So the fact of the matter is we need to move everybody to a defined contribution plan, a 401k style plan as far as that goes. Secondly, within the one minute of taking office and sitting in that chair, I'm going to repeal every wacky anti-business executive order that this governor has put out. We're going to make Connecticut a business-friendly state. And these folks that are out there creating jobs and investing their capital and money will know their governor. They'll be familiar with him and understand what he expects out of our economy. Thank you, Mayor Bowden. I'm going to allow uh, 30 seconds to Mr. Herbst to uh, defend himself. If you're going to reform or restructure pensions, leaders need to lead by example. I did that in Trumbull. I refused a pension from the town, insisted that all my department heads do the same. I'm the only candidate in this race that has said that if I'm elected governor, I'm going to refuse a pension from the state of Connecticut. I'm going to insist that all my agency and cabinet members do the same. We need to eliminate mileage reimbursement from pension padding that legislators currently are allowed to do. And we need to stop giving out health care that's better than what members of Congress receive to the political class. If we're going to change the way we produce these benefits, we have to change the culture. And it requires a proven reformer and Hartford outsider to go to Hartford to completely upend business Thank you, as sir. usual. Thank you, sir. Our next question is for Mr. Obsidnik, and it'll be asked by Mark Davis from WTNH. All right, you may be surprised to hear that I'm not going to ask any questions, but uh, questions from our viewers who submitted them uh, on our social media platforms uh, and viewers. This one came up a few times. If Donald Trump offered to come to Connecticut to campaign for you, would you accept? And I would add, <laughs> for the primary or the final election or both. I'll be 
very clear on this. I'm a military veteran. I always support our commander in chief. And And Donald Trump didn't create Connecticut's problems, and he's not going to solve our problems. He may help along the way, but it's time for us to own up to this challenge. And, and as Oscar Wilde once said, we all may be in the gutter together, but a few of us are looking up at the stars. And that's what leadership is, OK? So what you get with me is someone who will be the chief economic development officer of the state of Connecticut, the chief fiscal stability restorer to the state of Connecticut. Because when I went to sea my first night up to the North Pole, the captain of my submarine taught me an important lesson. He said, leaders set tone, tone creates culture, and culture is your destiny. Leaders set tone, tone creates a culture, culture is your destiny. And right now we have a leader who's a chief apologizer, a chief tax collector. So my tone will be very different. I will proudly, through policies and procedures, stand up to Charlie Baker, the governor, the good governor of Massachusetts, and say, seniors, hands off our businesses, Connecticut is open for business, and I will fight to keep you all in your chairs here so you all can sell more houses and we can turn the moving vans around. Thank you very much. But do Thank you, you want Mr. him Wilson. to campaign for you? That was the question from the viewer. I will always support the Commander-in-Chief. Do you want him to campaign for you? I will always support <laughs> Mr. Stemmerman, same question, sir. One minute. So I share uh, uh, Steve's view that we always support the Commander in Chief. Uh, what I would say, though, in our state is the challenges that we face here are ones that we're going to need to deal with ourselves. Uh, and the challenges that we have here are deep ones and ones that we're going to be talking about in this debate and for a long time to come. What we do need is partnership in Washington, and I will be there supporting the people of Connecticut every step of the way. Uh, one of the areas that we're going to be looking for partnership from Washington is how to rebuild our infrastructure. Uh, but when we set our own values here in Connecticut, they're our own. Our own values are reflected for me and my family. I'm married to the same woman for 20 years. I have five children. When I started my own business, I began with the statement of the values for starting those businesses. Those are the values that are my values and that I would lead in the state of Connecticut. Do you want him to campaign for you? I would be happy to welcome our Commander-in-Chief to our state whenever he wants to be here. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mayor Batten, same question. I absolutely would welcome the Commander-in-Chief. I, too, served in the military and have been proud of my service and, and within the United States Army and would welcome Donald Trump to come here anytime he wants. The fact of the matter is... <laughs> but the fact of the matter is this is a Connecticut problem caused by 35 years of Democratic leadership within the General Assembly. So we need to focus in on probably the most hated politician in the state of Connecticut, and that's Governor Malloy. And if we can keep the target on him Oops. and share with our residents about how poorly he's done for the state, everybody will welcome Donald Trump into the state of Connecticut. And finally, let me just say that any time you can get the ear of the President of the United States of America and share with him the beauty and the brilliance of this wonderful state that we live in. I'm going to do it. I will be in the, White, in the White House. I will be here in Connecticut sharing with them all that is great about our state. Thank you, Mayor Bowden. Mr. Herbst, would you like to use an opportunity? We absolutely welcome our president and our commander in chief when he comes to the state of Connecticut. And let me also say this. The Democrats want to make this election about Washington because they don't want to talk about their eight-year record of failure, their 40-year record of one-party rule in the legislature. They nominated a candidate at their convention, Ned Lamont, or as I like to call him, Retread Ned. They nominated a candidate that's to the left of Dan Malloy, that stood up and said basically that he isn't going to make the t tough decisions. He has said that he is going to raise taxes. He has said that he is going to put in tolls. Ned Lamont would be an absolute disaster for the state of Connecticut. And let's just remember something. The most unpopular person in the state of Connecticut is not President Trump. The most unpopular person in the state of Connecticut is Governor Dan Malloy. And this election, and this election is a referendum on his failure to lead our state to better days. I've lived in this state my entire life. This is the worst that I have ever seen it. And when my 93-year-old grandfather says this is the worst he's ever seen it, 
time to turn the page. It's time to end the Malloy era. It's time to get to work for the people of the state of Connecticut. Sure. Our next question will be asked by Christy Olds, and it's for Mr. Stemmerman. We have heard it mentioned already several times this evening that bringing business to Connecticut is part of the turnaround that we need here. But it's not always just about taxes or incentive packages. It's also about having a government that those businesses can work with. Other states have streamlined their permitting and their approval processes. What would be your administration's priorities to do that here in Connecticut and make the state more competitive? So it's clear that offering a package of bribes for businesses to stay here, of giving special deals, uh, doesn't work. Uh, Dan Malloy began that with the beginning of his administration, picking out five businesses. Uh, those businesses have either left or are in the process of leaving. What we need to do is to make our state attractive for businesses. And again, I come back to the idea, having run a business, invested in all kinds of businesses all over the world, what are our competitive advantages? What drew families and businesses here for decades? One of the most important is our location. Uh, and here, for realtors, I don't need to tell you the importance of location. And so what I'm doing tonight is I am revealing our next proposal, which is on transportation infrastructure. You know when you sell a house anywhere in the state that the location is of critical importance. Connecticut has a wonderful location between New York City and Boston. But our roads today are congested. Our highways are slower than they were in 1970. And in the southern part of the state where we are today, there isn't a commercial airport. What we need is outside the box thinking to solve these problems. The debate in Hartford is all about yes or no to tolls, about bankruptcy of our trust fund. We need fresh thinking. And our idea is to attract billions of dollars of private investment to rebuild our trains, roads, and airports, to get the train from New York City to Stanford in 30 minutes, to Bridgeport in 45, and here in New Haven, in 60 minutes. That's the kind of bold thinking that we need to bring business back and our state growing again. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Mayor Bowden? I would submit that uh, part of rebuilding our business climate is also based on relationships. That's why I mentioned earlier, we need to send a signal to all of the businessmen and women of the state that we are serious about uh, having you stay here, come here, or expand here. That's why the first thing I do was open up our welcome center to let people know that they're welcome in the state of Connecticut, not leave them locked and chained up every day. Secondly, I would speed up our permitting set, uh, process. We've already done that in the city of Danbury. We have what's called concurrent permitting. So you submit six sets of plans, which are then determined automatically how their approval is done. And we've turned around our permit process from a matter of months to a matter of weeks and sometimes days, depending on the, the process. For the state of Connecticut, I'll create a one-stop permit center where you'll be able to go and bring your plans, confirm with decision makers, and confer with decision makers, and get an answer about your project. We've got a grocery store in Danbury, wonderful family-owned company that has waited three years for a permit from the State Traffic Commission. So the first agency I'd abolish is the State Traffic Commission. <laughs> you know, it's really a question of priorities. You know, this governor thinks it's okay to take $15 million of your money and give it to a $27 billion hedge fund to move from Westport to Stanford. At the same time, they're passing oppressive regulations that are punitive towards small businesses and job creators. That will change in a Herbst administration. I am proud of how I streamlined the permitting process in Trumbull. We were able to balance eight budgets and deliver two tax cuts because our commercial economy grew 64.5% in those eight years because we made it easier, more efficient, and more effective to do business in our community. If I'm elected governor, I'm going to go to town on those departments that are punitive towards job creators, small business owners, and those people that are trying to get ahead in the state of Connecticut. The Connecticut Department of Transportation has failed you, and they have failed the citizens and taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. The bureaucratic second floor in that department needs to be completely overhauled. The DEP has become too far overreaching in its regulatory practices. The Connecticut Department of Motor Vehicles will be completely dismantled if I am elected Earth. governor of the state of Connecticut. You should not have to, you should not have to stand in line up, for six sir. hours to renew your license. Mr. We're Hurt. going to change it. I'm going to have to ask you, your time is up, and I think Mr. Abstindic would like to exercise one of his opportunities. 
Yeah, there's a lot of basic locking and tackling. I look at things, if you can't get a permit from the state of Connecticut in 90 days, it automatically gets approved. There's a lot of things we can do, which is just uh, table stakes. But let's think bold and differently. How are you all gonna sell more business, uh, more homes? I believe in the Connecticut's career corridors. I know it's an, an eye swim from, for a few of you here, but when I talked to someone in Idaho the other day, I said, did you realize that we have 42 colleges in Connecticut already? Do you realize that we have 24 Fortune 1000 companies here already? But what we don't have is leadership and good governmental management. We have all the assets here, ladies and gentlemen. We just need better leadership to turn the moving vans around. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next question is uh, once again for Mayor Boughton, Keith Faniff. Mayor Boughton, the state bailout of Hartford sparked uh, a lot of charges that uh, the capital city couldn't control its spending. But if you look at a per person basis, Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, and all of the distressed cities can't hold a candle to Fairfield County suburbs. Of the uh, 25 distressed cities and towns in the state, only seven even rank in the top half out of 169 in terms of spending. Westport, for example, actually spends double what Bridgeport spends per person. Is the problem urban spending or is the problem that the state still isn't properly distributing aid to cities and towns? Well, I'd look, I think it's a combination of both in some ways, but you have to start by making solid decisions for your community. So when you decide to build a baseball stadium for $55 million instead of building a job training center for your <laughs> residents, there's something really wrong there. And frankly, I think Hartford should have been allowed to go bankrupt. They need some tough love at this point. And so do some of our other, decision, other cities. Because in our community, we need the tough decisions and the tough choices to be able uh, to put ourselves in a strong financial position. Danbury is a triple-A community, but we, have, we are the second poorest city in Fairfield County, right behind Bridgeport. So the fact of the matter is, is that we watch our dollar wisely and we spend it purposely to be able to get the job done. We need to have a governor that does the same thing, and we need to have a governor that doesn't just throw cash at a problem, but actually holds people accountable for poor decisions that are made throughout the tenure. And I would argue with you a little bit about Hartford in the sense that there are some places in there that uh, in the past have been grossly, vastly overpaid. They have a city council where the, each per council person gets one aide to work with them for $85,000 a year. The city of Danbury has 21 council members. You know how many aides they have? One, $50,000 a year. You know how much money our council people get to do their job? Zero. In fact, this year we doubled the salary to zero again. So the fact of the matter is that there are and have been poorly made decisions within these communities that have come back to bite them time and time again. And so there has to be a time when we have to say enough. We can't keep pouring money without some accountability there. Thank you, sir. Mr. Obsidnik, you have one minute, sir. Look. We, we, it is a balance, I agree with Mark, you know, in terms of how we get through this equation here. Um, but what's important in my five-step plan to 300,000 jobs in these career corridors is pulling a model of what worked in New York City and what I'm glad that our Commission on Fiscal Stability and Economic Growth pulled in, Roosevelt Island. What my, Mayor Bloomberg saw was, how do you take a city, like our cities here, how do you attract, or if we have them, like our 42 universities, our universities to actually educate kids into jobs that are here and waiting for them? And it's happening in New York, and it's a model which we need to fulfill on, and that will bring the jobs into the cities to work with the businesses and allow people to live in cities to grow grand list and the things that we're talking about. But we have to address the growth of our cities long term so they can stand on their own along the way, because having one town propping up another town does not work in my economic universe. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stemmerer, one minute, sir. So Keith, one of the things that you noted in, in your writings on this topic is it's not just a spending issue, it's how much wealth are in, are in these cities. And what we need to do is we need to rebuild that wealth. And so just building upon this idea of what could we do with these transportation infrastructure projects. We're going to be in Bridgeport in the next few days, as I have been for the last few days, talking about the potential there. Just imagine if we could get the train there in 45 minutes to New York City. Imagine if we could add lanes to 95 so it's flowing again. Imagine if Sikorsky Airport became a major regional hub and the ferry service was a high-speed ferry service to Manhattan. People have been putting private money in despite the high taxes and the high regulations. We were at Steel Point Harbor 
where that's being developed into a marina that's going to have 200 boats. The Bijou in downtown, the oldest theater, has been, re has been renovated. The seeds are there. What we need is we need <coughs> leadership that understands our competitive advantages, can build them up so that our cities can grow again. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Herbst, would you like to use your opportunity? Keith, the problem uh, with the premise of your question is, here in Connecticut, we have consistently, as a government, rewarded bad behavior and punished good behavior. So we're cutting municipal aid to towns and cities that are well-managed, that maintain healthy fund balances, that fund their pensions, and we continue to throw money at problems that are perpetual. If I'm elected governor, I will send a bill to the legislature that does exactly what they did 20 minutes up the street in Springfield, Massachusetts. We need a financial control board in Hartford that is not advisory, that they have actual decision-making ability. Take the politics out of it. Give the city the tough pill of medicine it requires and send a message to other municipalities that have consistently been poorly managed because of patronage, waste, and mismanagement. The taxpayers of the state of Connecticut and their wallets are not a bottomless pit. We are not the Federal Reserve. We do not, you know, print money. And we have got to get serious about how we deal with these problems. And we have to stop rewarding bad behavior and give it a tough pill of Thank medicine. You, our next question is once again for Mr. Herbst, and it will be asked by Mark Davis. Uh, this question comes from Vicki in Quaker Hill, that's in Waterford, just outside New London. She said, I would like to know what each candidate plans to do about the influx of immigrants to our state. Are you for sanctuary cities? I am not. And let me say this. We are a country of immigrants. Uh, my great-grandparents came here to seek a better life and better opportunity for their families. My grandmother was raised by a single immigrant mother on the south end of Bridgeport during the Great Depression, lost her father at the age of six. Her mother could not read or write in English, but she knew this was a country of opportunity, and she came here legally. I want people to come to our country legally. We are a country of immigrants. That being said, that being said, I do not want people coming here illegally, and more importantly, I do not want criminal illegals in any one of our towns and cities that are compromising the health, safety, and welfare and of our citizens. I am opposed to sanctuary cities. If I am elected governor of the state of Connecticut, Luke Bronin, Tony Harp, and Joe Gannam will understand very clearly that they will either comply with federal immigration officials or they risk losing their funding from the state of Connecticut. We cannot compromise the safety and security of our residents. There have been well-documented instances of criminal illegals here that have committed additional crimes because they were not properly deported or processed. The most solemn obligation of the governor of the state of Connecticut is to protect the people of the state of Connecticut. And I will give the Connecticut State Police the resources they require, and I will end how they have been decimated over the course of the last eight years by this governor. Thank you, sir. Cameron, one minute. The most important responsibility for our governor is to make sure that the laws of our state and the land are enforced. Thank you. <laughs> and so this idea of sanctuary cities, uh, we cannot have cities, campuses that are rogue campuses. Tim, my family story is similar to yours. Uh, my grandfather growing up grew up, uh, to told me growing up about he <clears throat> grew up in Newark, New Jersey, the son of a wallpaper hanger who came here in search of a, of a better life. Uh, and it's important for us to make sure that we have a welcoming, uh, open society that brings people all over the world here. Uh, my father grew up in Elmira, New York, because when my family went through Ellis Island and they got off the train, that's where the train ended. Uh, and so there are more Severmans in Elmira uh, than anywhere else. Uh, and so I still get pictures of the Severman family grocery store there. Uh, we need to make sure that that story, which is my story, my family's story, is the story in Connecticut once again. Thank you, sir. Mayor Bowden? Um, I would say that uh, I am opposed to the designation of sanctuary cities. Um, I have a vast amount of experience with the issue of illegal <laughs> immigration uh, and certainly understand both sides of the argument. But look, the state of Connecticut recently passed something called the Trust Act. You probably don't even know it. It went through fairly easily through the legislature. And the Trust Act prohibits discussion from our state police with our federal agents on certain matters 
as they relate to immigration, customs, and enforcement. <clears throat> in essence, we have become a sanctuary state with incredible amount of benefit levels to be able to offer people to come here, and we provide free in-state tuition as well as a whole host of other benefits. When we do that, and when cities do that, and when counties do that, what we do is we create our own immigration law, and that's bad public policy. The United States Constitution is clear that immigration policy is a purview of the federal government. So we can't keep doing things that undermine the federal government and their enforcement of our laws. We need to be welcoming, but we've got to be a nation of laws first. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Obsidian, would you like to use your opportunity, sir? Yes, li likewise. As a military veteran, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution and to protect the people of this country. I believe a governor does three things. Keep people safe, take care of people that can't take care of themselves, and keep as much money in everyone else's pocket to grow an economy. On the first one, safety. For that reason, I, like these gentlemen up here, I do not support sanctuary cities. I think there has to be a strong alignment between law enforcement at every level. That being said, I'm a first-generation American on my father's side. My dad came here from Czechoslovakia six months before Hitler rolled through that country. My life would have been very different. My grandfather worked in Heasley Mine, number three of the coal mines of western Pennsylvania. So I have high regards for what immigration, legal immigration did for me and my family and others on this stage. And Washington has to address this, to have systems and processes put in place to address this important topic. I'm sorry, I believe, Mayor Button, you may have misspoken regarding free tuition. Did you not? No, I said in-state tuition. In-state tuition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there a clarification, Mayor? Okay, our next question is again from Mr. Obsidnik. Christy Olds? We have mentioned the transportation issues here in our state several times tonight. Um, it's no secret that it negatively impacts home values, business growth, quality of life, all sorts of issues that determine where people live and where they work. The poll done by Connecticut Realtors shows that the vast majority of people do not support tolls. <clears throat> would you move forward with tolls and putting them on Connecticut highways, or how else would you fund those necessary transportation improvements? Important question for all of us here. Uh, I believe in nothing that sends more money to Hartford that is unchecked. Because whenever we send more money to Hartford, what happens? It's spent on some other project. When my business was having trouble, I couldn't turn around to my customers and say, would you pay me an extra 10% more? I had to look and be much more efficient with the resources that I had. So what we first do is, is take that special transportation fund and make it special, ensure it's a lockbox, not a cookie jar for politicians in Hartford. That is funded at about $1.5 billion a year. And $400 million has been pulled out to pay for other obligations in the general fund, which I do not agree with that principle. As we move forward, the second part is, why does it cost the rest of the country about a dollar, effectively a dollar to build a mile of road, but Connecticut, two dollars? So we need to do an audit of every project that the Department of Transportation is undergoing because there is efficiency gains to be brought in. I will not start with increasing your taxes. You start with looking at the monies you have and then doing audits to say, are you being as efficient as possible with the money that you've sent to Hartford? Because so far, we have not gone down that path. Along the way, we have to look at bringing other resources in. And it might be um, public-private partnerships around airports and seaports. We have, as I said, in my five steps to 300,000 jobs in eight years, infrastructure and transportation is an important part to help enabling these 300,000 jobs going forward. Are tolls part of that plan or no? They are not. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor Bouton. Well, first, let me address the toll uh, issue. I've said it before and I'll say it again tonight. I will strap myself to a pole of I-84 before I let a single toll go in this state. <laughs> Tolls represent a $700 million tax on the middle class of the state, men and women that drive every day to work that are just trying to make ends meet each week. More importantly, the legislature, the Democrats in the legislature, have talked a lot about a lockbox for the transportation uh, fund. And that really scares me. Remember the lottery. Wasn't that supposed to fund education for our kids? And remember the state constitutional spending cap when they implemented the income tax. Wasn't that supposed to stop the increase of spending within our state government? This legislature, led by the Democrats, has de demonstrated it cannot abide by its own rules and regulations. There's no lockbox strong enough to be able to get them not to intercept these funds. So we need to do three things. Change the culture of the legislature by telling them they can't raid the fund. Two, 
prioritize our bonding, and three, reinstate this transportation strategy board. Thank you, sir. Mr. Herbst, you have a minute? Well, I do not want Mayor Bowden to get hit by a car on I-84, <laughs> so no to tolls. <laughs> No, to talk. Thanks, Dan. That is not disparaging, by <laughs> the way. That was not disparaging. I'm looking out for Not at all. Sorry, <laughs> Very look, 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 folks, in the, last, in the last legislative session, transportation advocates told the legislature, give us the additional half percent on the sales tax, don't cap us on bonding, and we're going to have all the money we need to fund the transportation projects that have already been approved and encumbered. And three months after the legislature adopted a budget in October, Governor Malloy announced the cancellation of $4 billion of infrastructure projects approved in the state of Connecticut. Now, why did that happen? Well, first, we can't even go to Wall Street to negotiate a successful bond sale because of the insolvency of the STF. Two, what a lot of people don't talk about is how this DOT commissioner has increased operational encumbrances to the tune of 60%. Three, Hartford insiders time and again have raided the Special Transportation Fund to artificially balance the budget. When I'm elected governor, day one, forensic audit of the Special Transportation Fund. We're going to find out where the money's being spent. We're going to be reprioritized. Re you give them more revenue, they will find another way to misappropriate it. Yes, sir. And oh. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stemmerman, you use your opportunity, sir. So, Christy, this is an area where there's a real human cost. I was just with a woman who had a job for 20 years. She commutes on I-95. It's only 20 miles. She now has high school students and she quit her job because it takes her two hours to get back and forth to work. This is an area where we're stuck in the rhetoric of the past from career politicians and what we need is not sound bites but solutions. And that's what we have on our website. We posted it this evening for our transportation plan of davidstemmerman.com. When we talk about how do we cut costs to make room for this, we talk about economize, prioritize, and privatize. When I talk about prioritize, we have this CT fast track buses. Uh, one of the guys in the Senate described they're big, they're fast, I'm sorry, they're big, they're green, and they're empty. Uh, and so we need to make uh, decisions here. But for privatization, I've gone all over the world. The airports, the trains, the roads, they're billion dollar projects, they're run by private businesses, they're phenomenal. We need outside the box thinking to bring that kind of investment here, to bring that kind of opportunity sorry, to our state. Up. I apologize. Gentlemen, we're going to move on to our next question. I believe this might be our last question so that we can get to our um, closing statements. This question will be for Mr. Stemmerman and asked by Keith Faniff. Uh, since the early 1990s, Connecticut's had an arrangement with the tribal nations in southeastern Connecticut. We give them an exclusive right to casino gambling, and they share 25% of the video slot receipts that they receive. Uh, what once brought in more than $350 million is expected to bring in only about $200 million this year. Some legislators said it's time to explore breaking the compact, licensing somebody to run a casino in Bridgeport, and seeing if we can get a better deal. What would you support? So Key, thanks for that question. When this state is looking to cut a new deal, do you want somebody who has a business background or a different kind of background? This is a time for a new deal. The situation 20 plus years ago when we made our compact with the tribes, it's changed dramatically. The competitive dynamic has changed dramatically. There's now competition in New York and Massachusetts and that's why our receipts have gone down. The deal that we cut in terms of the percentage of slot revenues that we share is no longer competitive. There's been an important Supreme Court decision now that allows us to have uh, sports betting uh, be legalized. There is now the opportunity for us to cut a new deal. MGM, which is a private business, is willing to invest $675 million in Bridgeport. That's private money. They promise to bring at least 2,000 jobs there. I've heard people object to that, saying, oh, there's going to be too much traffic in Fairfield County, and that's why we shouldn't do it. Uh, my view is exactly the opposite. This is why we need to invest in our transportation infrastructure so we can bring those jobs there. That's why we need to have the train, which I keep coming back to. Train in 45 minutes from New York City, people are going to be coming right in. You combine that with the Steel Point Harbor development, a revitalized downtown. This is the kind of thinking that revitalizes Bridgeport. We need somebody who thinks differently, somebody from a business background who says, let's find a deal that works for everyone. That's the kind of leadership that I would bring to our state. Sir, Mr. Herbst, one minute. 
The next governor needs to have the practical understanding and humility to recognize that this job is bigger than any one man or woman. It's a collective team effort. It requires buy-in from not only your, your cabinet, but also the legislature. So clearly, here's my position on the issue. I do not want to expand casino gaming if we are taking jobs from one area of the state and moving them to another. Any type of casino expansion needs to be cognizant that we're infecting people's lives and their jobs. Second, we need to become more competitive with respect to licensing fees. I can tell you that if you look at licensing fees that have been paid in other states as compared to Connecticut, we are clearly below the curve. One of the things that I would say uh, to the tribal nations, should I become governor, is that we have to get realistic with the licensing fees that are imposed by other states. And finally, I want Bridgeport to succeed. That is the city of my birth. That is where my roots are from. But I want a plan that doesn't rely on a one solution fix. I believe Sikorsky Airport should be expanded to allow for commercial traffic. Time we sir. have to come up with a transportation mitigation plan. It's got to be a holistic sir. approach. Time is up. Mr. Sidnick. So I drive around this RV. We call it RV1 instead of Air Force One. And people are autographing it. And a few days ago, I'm in Bridgeport. And I get out, and there's a man sitting out there. And uh, he asked if I had any food in there. I gave him some food on the RV. And uh, he said, why are people signing this? I say, they sign their ideas. And he said, well, I need a job. I've been out of work for, I think it's about two years. He signs the RV. I think when you're looking in the eyes of a person who wants a job and wants prosperity, it's important to realize that that is what a governor does. Safety, take care of people that can't take care of themselves, and put as much money in everyone else's pocket. So when it comes to this gentleman, my five-step plan to 300,000 jobs in eight years, I look at something like the casino in Bridgeport. If someone wants to invest $750 million, it doesn't cost the government anything, and it employs people, I'm supportive of it. Thank you, sir. Mayor Boughton, you can use your opportunity, sir. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a profound difference between government and business. In business, you tell people what to do and you expect that it gets done. In government, you have to lead people. You have to bring them to a consensus as this is the direction we ought to go. The problem we have with casino gambling here in the state of Connecticut, or any kind of gambling, is we don't have a comprehensive approach. No one's done an independent study to understand how does casino gaming fit in with things like lottery and keno and every other part of gaming that is sort of come into our lives in every other way. I mean, have you ever stood at a, at a, uh, a grocery store and waited for somebody to pick one of those crazy scratch-off games? There's got to be 475,000 of them. Impossible to figure out. Do we really understand where we're generating our revenue and how we're generating our revenue and how best to be able to impact uh, gaming in Connecticut and derive the most possible revenue we can for our taxpayers, the people footing the bill? Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Stinnick, you can use your last opportunity, sir. Yeah, I'd say it's an, in <coughs> excuse me, it's an interesting point. Um, I don't think we need government sitting there telling us more of what we should do. It's good to look at things and ask questions when business brings an opportunity to you, but I think we need to unleash the private sector, entrepreneurship, and what businesses have done in this state for generations. And that's the focus we should do. Under my administration, we are open for business. We will streamline permitting rules. We will make the state a lower cost place to do business. We won't turn to a, a, a group of bureaucrats and say, how should we engineer our casino industry? I think we need to look at how do we build 300,000 jobs in Connecticut over the next eight years. And that will be my focus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, we are just about out of time. We have one minute left before we need to start our closing statements. So I'm going to interject and use a little of my prerogative here as the moderator. One word, what is the most important issue for you in this campaign? I'll start with Mr. Stemmerman. Growth. Sir? Jobs in the economy. Sir? Pension and benefit reform to lead to growth. Thank you. People. Thank you, sir. We had a few in there. There were a couple more than one word. but. <laughs> Hyphenated. I didn't answer. Yeah, was hyphenated. 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 Commas and hyphenated. Great. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. At this time, I want to move on to our closing statements. Um, you'll each have one minute and 30 seconds for your closing statement, and we will start with uh, Mr. Stemmerman. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. You're a part of the democratic process, and thank you very much for being here. I began this journey on the road where I taught my then six-year-old daughter how to ride a bicycle. We heard for our first 
question that people are leaving the state. Well, if we're the average family, for every three children you have, two of the three of them are going to move out of our state after they graduate school. That daughter is now driving a car. She's got one more year to college. I'm concerned that we're going to lose her. My fifth child, though, William, he's nine years old. He said, Dad, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? He likes video games. So he said, would you live in Japan? Would you live in the UK? I said, William, I would live right here. I live in this country, in this state, in this house. I'm here in Connecticut by choice. I grew up in Massachusetts rooting for Larry Bird. Could have used his jump shot a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and it's crazy to me that the logo of GE is now on the uniform of the Boston Celtics. This place brought me here. I got a job here that changed my life. I brought my family here. And I started a business here from a single desk that grew to be a business that managed billions of dollars because it was the best place in the country to live, work, and raise a family. With strong leadership, with the support of everyone here, all coming together, it can and it will be again. Thank you very much. Applaud for that. Thank you. Mr. Obsidnik, one minute and 30, sir. For 30 years, we've been going down a road, and that road has been led by the career politician in Hartford. Well, Robert Frost said, when you get to the fork in the road, and we're at the fork in the road, and the fork is the one that I want to talk to you about, the pragmatic business outsider who knows how to work with government. We're seeing Charlie Baker beat our butts across the border, come down our path, because that's the path I want to create. I'm a Stanford kid. I attend the US Naval Academy. I did my submarine service just down the road in Groton. You know, when you find yourself about eight feet under a 10,000 ton Russian submarine, they have no idea that you're monitoring them. You realize in life there are more important things than self-interest and special interest. What matters is the mission. After I got out of the service, I'm fortunate that I've created high-tech jobs, the type of jobs we need here in Connecticut. One company I was involved with, Siri, out in California. Two Yale professors were involved in the creation of Siri. Can you imagine if, C if Siri had been born in New Haven, Connecticut, instead of Palo Alto, Connecticut, the discussion we'd be having tonight? So that's why I want to walk and chew gum with you. The walking is restoring fiscal stability to our state. The chewing gum is building and inspiring us to build the jobs engine. That's why my plan, five steps to create 300,000 jobs in Connecticut over the next eight years, is the bold vision I want you all to join my path on. Thank you very much for hosting this uh, debate for us, and you all listen to us. Thank you, sir. Mr. Herbst, a minute and 30, sir. Thank you so much for hosting this event. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important state election of our lifetime. And as Republicans go to the polls on August 14th and select the nominee of our party, the decision that you make comes down to one word, and that word is trust. Who can Republican primary voters trust to not only prosecute the campaign, that will lead us to victory in November. But who can Republican primary voters, and for that matter, the people of the state of Connecticut, trust to be that change agent, to get elected and do what they say they're going to do? Ladies and gentlemen, I am a proven reformer and a Hartford outsider. I've done it in Trumbull. I will do it again in Hartford. If ever there was a time to elect leaders that are going to tell you what you need to hear, it's now. We can't afford to elect politicians that tell you what you want to hear. Because for 40 years, we have gotten in this mess because too many people have been focused on the next election. And being the youngest person in this race, I am focused on the next generation. I am a fighter. And for the last 17 months, I have taken the fight to a pervasive culture of entitlement in Hartford that has compromised your towns, your cities, your future, and the future of your children and your families. Now is the time to elect leaders that are going to tell people what they need to hear because this election is about the next generation. I'm asking you to not only vote for me on August 14th, I'm asking you to join me. Join me in this fight to save the state of Connecticut so that working together we can guarantee that the reality of Connecticut lives up to the promise of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbst. Mr. Boughton. Well, thank you very much, and thank you so much to Connecticut Realtors and WTNH again for hosting this. We appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas about the future of our states. Look, 
You, we have just spent the last hour talking about the list of last. Everybody out there gets it. You all understand the challenges that face our state. So I just want to share with you that my experience in Danbury has been completely different. We lead the list of firsts. I'm proud of our tax rate, one of the lowest in the state of Connecticut for a major city. I'm proud of our crime rate, one of the safest cities in the state of Connecticut. I'm proud of our business climate, where we're just rated as one of the best cities to start a business in. And I'm proud of our low unemployment rate at 3.9%. You see, when you bring Republican ideas and Republican principles and build consensus around those ideas, you can make good things happen. Connecticut used to be the envy of New England. It was a place between Boston and New York that everybody came to. As your next governor, I'm going to make sure that we are once again the envy of New England. Because ultimately, this election is not about me. In fact, it's not about anybody here on this dais. This election is about you. It's about your home, your neighborhood, your city, your town, and this state. And we are going to change Connecticut, street by street, block by block, town by town, to once again be the place that all of us call the envy of New England. God bless you and God bless America. Gentlemen, I want to thank you personally for joining us tonight and coming here. It's been a pleasure to work with your campaigns and get this organized. Um, our members, we sell Connecticut and we hope whichever one of you gets the nomination and is our candidate in the general election. We hope that once one of you gets into office, if that be the case, that we'll have a relationship and Connecticut Realtors will be at the table. So thank you. Give me a big round of applause for our candidates. Join me also in thanking our panelists, Christy Olds, Mark Davis, and Keith Faniff. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank our staff here at CTR. They did a great job. And the people at WTNH, our media partner, it was a pleasure to work with you all, your consummate professionals. Thank you. Please <laughs> 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 vote on August 14th and have a good night. Thank you all for joining us this evening.